A small disclaimer, because the title of my talk is Automating the Automator, it is kind of clickbaity. So, you know, I don't want to get your hopes up too high. So, a small disclaimer. Uh, what we don't going to talk about is things like GitHub Copilot, uh, co uh, low code, no code platforms, and these kind of things. So, basically, we're not going to talk about how um, you can lose your job. <laughs> uh, although, side note, like the, the idea for the talk came from my first job which I lost by automating too much, but I'll talk about it later also. Um, so since we, this is a two-track conference, there's also another interesting talk going on. So the two line don't, uh, too long didn't read or didn't listen, pay attention. The summary of this talk is, uh, we'll go through how we can parse our source code, transform it, and turn it back into source code. So if this slide like, makes sense to you, if you can kind of imagine how that would work or how you can do it, then uh, there is a good chance that this talk is not for you. I'm going to bore you. So if you, know, if you want to go to the other room, uh, please do so. I'll take a sip of water and pretend, that, pretend I don't see you leave. <laughs> All right. So a small horror story introduction. So I've been doing programming for around 20 years, actually more than that. but kind of makes me sound very old. Um, and the first job that I got, it, it was the, the ad for the job was kind of nice. You know, was, uh, like do, I would become a webmaster. Uh, I would create web pages, do some programming. Um, but it turned out that we were supposed to build static pages manually. Uh, you know, and then basically, you know, doing static pages before it was um, uh, popular. So we didn't have any generators or anything at all, any um, automated tools. Um, so they would basically, every Saturday, they would come in with requirements. So we need to change these pages. We, we, the company was an e-commerce site. Um, uh, they had a retail store, but they also opened up a shop on the internet. And they basically wanted to sell their products online. So you know, we had to make sure that the online store would match what they had in, in, the, um, in the retail store as well. And we all did that, did that manually. So uh, you can imagine I'm a lazy programmer, like Keith mentioned. Um, I started out with Perl, and one of the good traits of a programmer is being lazy because then you automate as much as possible, which is why Perl scripts were popular at that time. Um, so I talked to my boss, and I said, well, you know what? We can make this easier. Like, we can make a, a system which will take the input from another system or clicking around from, from a user and basically generate the site for us. Um, and we also built other tools like a bot that would um, crawl um, one of those comparison websites and make sure that the, the offering that we had was just one euro better than what the competitors offered. And you know, along like in a year and a half, we built these tools. And after a year and a half, they said, like, oh, we have a nice system in place. We don't need you anymore. So me and five others were basically uh, being let, let go. And I'm happy that they didn't kill me uh, for that. Um, but yeah, I basically I, I automated my own job. I made sure that I didn't have a job by doing a too good of a job. Um, come on. Uh, so yeah, whenever you know somebody comes to me with a uh, with requirements in which everything is specified. I think, well, if you already know how well it should work, then why don't you make it so? Why don't you do it yourself? Uh, so, you know, in my job, uh, I like it to solve problems, to talk about ideas, to see how we can approach a problem, how we can solve it. But if somebody comes to me and says, like, you know, you should do it this way, then uh, I'm like, OK, just go ahead, do it yourself, make it so. So this talk actually um, originated a few years back. Uh, at a meetup in which we uh, didn't have speakers, so we had a few drinks and we you know, tried to do a hackathon. Uh, and at the time, Elixir had some changes in which she deprecated a few functions uh, in favor of better naming or you know, remove some functions. Um, and you know, just like if somebody tells me, if the compiler tells me, okay, this function is deprecated, please use that one, I'm thinking, well, that's nice, that's very useful. But if you already know that, why don't you make that change for me? You know, make it so. 
Uh, so we started thinking about how we can approach that problem, uh, how we can solve it. So, you know, one of the changes was the string to char list got deprecated in favor of string to char list without the extra uh, underscore here. And that's, that's a, like an easy change to make. You can string replace it, um, you know. But there were also other uh, changes in which cases just string manipulation doesn't cut it. Like uh, filter map function got replaced by having two functions, filter and map. And then in that case, you cannot just say, you know, I want to replace just this string with another thing. You actually have to make a change or ask the computer to make a change by understanding your code a little bit. So it needs to make some meaningful changes. Um, so how can we do that? But first, before I dive into it, I want to talk a little bit, like briefly, um, just to make sure that we're on the same page. How does the compiler actually make sense of our code? Uh, so the compiler takes our source code, um, parses it into separate tokens, so words, so to speak, and after that, it builds up a, um, an abstract syntax tree, uh, which is basically like, in this case, an Elixir data structure representation of our source code. You could uh, talk about it that way. Um, so how does it look like if we have the function sum with parameters one and three? Uh, you can use the quotes function to get the AST from that. Um, and then you basically get uh, a tuple, three element tuple with the name of the function, some metadata and the actual, um, the actual parameters. And if you're a web developer, it's kind of similar to a DOM, right? And we can do DOM manipulations so, you know, we should also be able to do these kind of things as well. Uh, so the idea, sorry. Won't go to the next slide, yeah. So the idea is basically to have the source code, um, parse it into an AST, change the AST, and go back to source code. And in other communities, like JavaScript, it's called the code mod. Uh, so if we express that in code, it would look like this. So we read the contents of a file. We uh, get the AST from, from that part. Um, we then change it. So macro postwalk is a function just like enum map, which walks our tree structure, uh, passes it onto a function. That function changes it, uh, and you get a modified tree in this case. Um, so in this case, we, you know, we take that to char list, transform it and write it back to a file. So we said, OK, this is easy. No, this should, should work. Uh, so we tried it out on a, on a module, um, very simple. But then we got this back. And this, well, it's correct uh, Elixir, probably. But it's not how we write our function, like how we write our code. And there's also some, some weird things going on. Because uh, all of a sudden, comments uh, like they disappeared because comments, they don't matter to the compiler. Like, they, they're not code that's being executed. So the, uh, the compiler, if it transforms it to AST, it just throws it away. Uh, and a function macro to string, so to uh, turn the AST back to a string, is not, um, doesn't format your code. That's what a formatter does. But a formatter uh, doesn't actually uh, think what your code's means it only looks at the tokens, so it only tries to pre print the tokens, like the document that you have written. Uh, so we tried to marry the two, um, we didn't kind of succeed, and Arian gave a talk about it in 2019, in which he kind of highlighted what, what those, you know, what things we stumbled upon, what the difficulties were, uh, and he and Jose, they went on a discussion like how can we solve it, um, you know, the Arn also has a day job. I have a day job. Jose has a huge list of things to do, so it's not his job to you know, fix our problems. We have to do it ourselves. Um, so a few years later, um, Dorgan came along. His real name is Lucas San Roman. Uh, but like if you're on Discord or Slack or Twitter, uh, GitHub, you'll see this handle up, uh, come along more often. Um, he actually, you know, I mentioned that to him, and I asked him, like, how would you solve it? 
And you know, the hero he was, he went ahead and he had a discussion with, with Jose, and he actually wrote functions uh, for the latest Elixir version, which solved my problems. So if you're watching, thank you very much for, for your effort. Um, so yeah, I was like excited, like, yay, we finally have the tools to now uh, address this, uh, this, this problem. Uh, and at the same time, like he, he made a pull request for, to Elixir, but he also wrote a new package called Sorcerer, which would kind of help you uh, do these things to, to you know, write these code modes, et cetera. So let's, um, let's take an example. So if we have this, this piece of code, uh, if you run this through Credo, a linter, it will give you a warning saying, hey, maybe you should write it in a different way because you have an unless with it with a negative predicate, uh, maybe you want to turn it around and say if allowed, and then you know, maybe that makes more sense to, to, to developers. So how would, we, how would we approach that? So we take the source code, we use the sorcerer library in this case to parse the string, uh, because uh, sorcerer in this case, it will also add metadata to the AST, like where are the comments, where do parents start, where do parents end, those, you know, those kind of things. Uh, we can still do the same transformation, like the, the change the AST, and then use sorcerer again to have a formatted uh, string uh, get back our source code, right? So um, yeah, this is basically the same same part. So if we get the AST from uh, from sorcerer, we can walk the tree, uh, look for the parts that we want to change, return a new version, and that's it. Um, and besides this way of working, Sorcerer also has other APIs. I'm not going to talk too much about it because I don't want to turn this into a tutorial talk. You know, then you, I mean, you can also look it up yourself. Uh, but it also has a zipper in case you walk a tree and want to uh, go back in the tree, uh, you know, look around, see what's left, see what's right, etc. Uh, and it also has another API which allows you to build a patcher. So if you only want to change uh, a few lines in your source code and not have your whole documents being pre-printed. Uh, then you can use Patcher to say, you know, I want to change this part of my source code, and we'll change a new, just a replacement for that part of the string in your code, instead of format the whole documents. Um, I'm not sure if, if like, who, who doesn't use a formatter, by the way? Everybody does, OK. So I'm guessing most of you won't use the Patcher API. So. Let's talk about some fun parts. So now that we have this, this library, how can we use it? Like, you know, what kind of tools can we build around this, 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 this package? Um, so I'm a lazy developer, once again. Uh, and one of the things that, that I find like uh, what I think can be improved is if you use the Phoenix generators, uh, you know, you want to create uh, something like Phoenix Gen Live, uh, then it creates the controllers, views, etc. But it won't add the route to a route file. It will say in the middle, like, oh, I've, you know, I've generated these files for you. You can test it. You can try it. But please add this one line to your router. And I'm like, OK, if you already kind of know what has to be changed, why don't you do it? Make it so. And um, it's understandable why it wasn't possible in the past, because we didn't have these, these tools. Uh, but now maybe you know it's time to, to start a discussion, thinking how we can implement this in uh, or use this in Phoenix as well to do these kind of changes. And I was thinking other things as well, like um, Rails got famous because uh, David, uh, you know, made a video: how can we create a blog in 15 minutes? And he would just generate the blog by using the generators. But we as developers, we don't always start with a fresh project. You know, we sometimes change a blog to add a comment section to allow users to log in and these kind of things. Um, but that's not possible from a generator because that's kind of a template, a string template, uh, and won't, it doesn't know what your code does. It won't be able to change your code. So now that we have Sorcerer, we could also start thinking about you know, having, being the next um, tool which doesn't allow us to just build a blog post in 15 minutes, but also change uh, what we have built to also include a com comment section, to include a part in which users can log in, et cetera. 
Uh, and I think that there's no other framework or tool that already uh, has that. So yeah, maybe if somebody has time uh, to spend, please have a look. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to take a sip of water. So other things that we can build with it are refactoring tools. So who has used Credo before? OK, a lot of you. So I also uh, use uh, Credo. And if you, you're used to Rubicop from the Ruby community, it also has an extra flag in which you can not just suggest refactorings, but also execute them for you. So uh, recently, I uh, took over a project for somebody uh, uh, who, wasn't, who, who is kind of new to Elixir, came from a different language, and it kind of shows. Like, they have their own idiomatic way of you know, working from that language. They uh, started using Elixir, and if you run, run uh, Mixed Credo, you'll get a gazillion of uh, warnings. Um, and they're not things that are they're new to me. Um, so I like, you know, I've done this before. It feels like grind work. Uh, why doesn't Credo do it for me? Uh, so I actually, you know, gave it a little try to see how we could do that. And it turns out it's rather easy. It just takes you four steps. Uh, so you actually create a new plugin for Credo. You, in the configuration file in .credo .exs, you add one line, just saying, I want to use this, this module, this plugin. And step two is to write to, in that plugin to um, say, well, you know, if, if I run the suggest command, so that's the default command that you run with Credo, I want to inject uh, to execute an extra module after it has done the filter issues step. I think that this is really nice because, you know, this way Credo allows you to build your own tools on top of it, which very nicely integrates with it. So what we basically do after it has, you know, um, run through your source code, found all the issues, it will fil filter some of those out if you, you know, based on your uh, uh, configuration. And after that, we, we are going to step in and we're going to try to auto-correct those. Uh, so one of the modules could look like this. Um, so we basically ask uh, Credo what the current list of issues is. We make sure that it's, you know, the issues that are in there are the ones that we can auto-correct. And we basically you know, we do this kind of the same thing that we did before. We parse the string with an ASD, we apply the changes, and we turn it back into the string. Um, yeah, so this, this would be then the function that actually does the, the changes. And voila, that's it. Um, other things that we could do is like easing uh, using libraries. So if, if you're used to uh, using Ecto to define your schemas, maybe you've seen a talk today or, you know, um, You've read a blog post and think, oh, this is a nice approach to you know, solve these problems. I want to start using this library. But it also means that I have to make some changes to my code. If the library you know, is really geared toward going from A to B, like using Ecto uh, and going to type schemas because it saves you writing some code, uh, it could also include a script, a code mod, to actually do that for you. I mean, wouldn't that be nice? If you know, the only thing you have to do is install the, 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 the new library, run a script, and your code is actually transformed into using that library to its full extent. Right? Really nice. And I think uh, Surface is the one who actually um, has, uh, is doing that. So if you run mixed Surface in it, it will create a bunch of files for you, like a demo Surface um, component. But it will also add the routes and change the views to include uh, the surface stuff. Um, and I think that's, that's really nice. Other things um, is improve the editor tools. Uh, for example, you know, having uh, refactoring tools in which you want to uh, replace or change the name of a function or variable to Nicolas Cage, for example. Uh, you know, these kind of things. It should be, should be fairly easy to do that as well. And I think for us, uh, Wrangler is, is a very good source of inspiration. Uh, so for those who are not familiar with it, it's a tool built for Erlang, uh, for refactoring tools. Um, and it has a lot of nice, nice features. 
So one of them is, for example, called genera generalized um, uh, function. So if we have this, this piece of code, and in here in the bottom, we have a static string. So that's never going to change. Whenever you call that function, it's going to you know, print the same thing. But what if we want to, to change that, that uh, function to take that string as input? You know? So that function becomes more configurable, easier to test, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the only thing then, then in, in what you have to do in Wrangler is select that string, uh, choose the, the, uh, the option generalize input, and it transforms your code in such a way uh, that it will change the, the function to include that as an input, but it will also at the same time change all the places in which that function is being called and include that string that you just, you know, that was static before. And there are also a lot of other tools like um, uh, selecting a piece of code, extracting that to a function, uh, or, you know, going the other way around, uh, inlining that function. Um, and I think they're, they're currently at a stage in which they also want to um, merge that into the Erlang language server. So I think, I'm guessing, soon it will also be available through Visual Studio Code and all the other editors that are using the language server. Um, and other communities, like the JavaScript community, they have a ton of these code mods. Uh, so for example, this is a tool to actually help you write those in which you have the, the, the original source code, you can see the ASD, uh, you can write the mod of, uh, your code modes and see what the, the output would be. Um, and I mean, if you write that code mode once for one module, you can easily apply it to all the, the, the places in your source code uh, where that would be applicable and, and just change it. And maybe also, you know, other fancy things. Uh, like JavaScript, they, they have their transpilers in which they, you know, if you don't have the latest uh, JavaScript version, you can still use newer versions of it by just transpiling to an older one. And if anyone feels adventurous, um, I thought of a good name for, for if you ever want to, want to write a transpiler from Go to Elixir, uh, then just name it Go to Elixir. So, um, coming to, to conclusion, to a summary, um, I think code mods are very useful because we can build a lot of great tooling around it. Um, and if you, also, if you learn this, you'll learn to uh, work with the ASD, which will also improve your understanding of the tools that, are, that you are using. It will improve your uh, knowledge about Elixir, and I think that's you know, a big plus uh, in the end. Uh, some drawbacks, of course, it takes more time to, to write it. Uh, it takes more time to get it right. Um, and you're not, I'm, I'm guessing you're not going to refactor on a daily basis. If you have stakeholders and you tell them every day on a stand-up you're going to do your refactor, uh, I'm guessing they're not going to be happy. Um, and not everything is solvable by doing code modes. So one of the things that I've stumbled upon is um, if you, um, like make a syntax error or if you use a keyword list in a wrong way. So if you have a keyword list of, uh, like a list of atoms and you add a keyword list in between, uh, the compiler will yell at you because it has to be at the end of the list. Uh, and that's something you cannot change in this case with Sorcerer because when, it's tri when it tries to parse your source code, it will get a syntax error so it won't you know, proceed uh, with parsing your code. So. I want to thank a few, be before I close up, I want to thank a few people, uh, especially Lucas for, for, for his efforts, for writing Sorcerer, for uh, you know, making the pull requests, um, Arjan for always being, having my back. Wojtek, I haven't much, uh, like, talked about him much during this talk, but he was also one of the first people who also tried it out, and he has written, you know, he has a lot of thoughts about this, and I discussed it also with him a few times. Jose always for his, uh, yeah, endless efforts. I sometimes feel he has a bunch of clones in, your, in his basement because whenever you know, write a message to him, it doesn't matter if it's on what platform, within 10 minutes you have an answer. And I'm kind of amazed how, how he does that. Um, and it shows like in these past 10 years how the community has grown. I think, yeah, Jose is definitely an inspiration when it comes to that. 
And lastly, I want to thank the company that I work for currently, XPay, uh, because you know, they've covered my cost and helped me get here to give a talk. So thank you all for listening, for attending. Um, if you want to look at the slides and the things that I've mentioned, uh, it's on GitHub. There's also a readme with the things that have, you know, that relate to this talk of, or which I've mentioned. And I hope you now have the feeling to build better tools to automate your job. You know, you now have the power to improve your life, I hope. So, that being said, thank you for listening. Okay, cool. I have a mic here. I'm not sure if this is the one you're looking for. Yeah. You're making me run around. Yeah. Uh, who was it again? It was you. Yeah. I'd be very excited to have uh, extract function refactoring and. Um, change function signature refactoring supported in IDE. I was just wondering uh, what's, what, if you've got one or two ideas of how we could quickly get there in Elixir, and um, is there any community projects that you know, people in the audience could help with? Uh, yeah, so um, like m most editors nowadays, they use the, the language server to, uh, you know, to offer these functionalities. Um, there's one thing currently with, with, well, I wouldn't call it an issue, but you know, a thing that to keep in mind um, is that the Elixir language server also has to be compatible up to a certain version. So the changes that I've mentioned, they're quite recent, 1.13. And if I remember correctly, the language server supports from 1.10 going up. Uh, so it means that we cannot just, you know, n just right now uh, include these, these, these changes to make it possible. Um, but yeah, I, I think if you're like looking for extract functions and these kind of things, I would look at uh, the Zipper um, uh, API from Sorcerer, because in there you can you know you can go to a piece of the AST and walk b up and down the tree. Because you probably also have to look around, to see which variables are used, which functions are called, uh, to at a other place in the source code add that a new function again. Uh, so I'm guessing that's kind of the, the zipper API is the thing you're looking for. Any more questions? Okay, once again, round of applause. Thank you.